today we have Manuel in the room from Nagami uh, with us to tell us a little bit more about his vision and what Nagami does. So before we dig in, like Manuel, can you tell me a little bit about the background of yourself? And yeah, and then also about Nagami. What does Nagami do and what's the idea and uh, concept behind Nagami? Yeah, um, hi, uh, thank you for the, for the introduction and the invitation for, for this interview. Um, yeah, so as a brief introduction of myself, I'm, uh, I'm an architect. Um, so I studied in Madrid and then I specialized in, in computational design uh, in London at the Architectural Association back in 2009. And then, uh, right after I started uh, running a, a research lab at UCL, the Bard at the School of Architecture, um, investigating about new uh, construction methods that uh, would take advantage of uh, uh, automation tools uh, such as robotic fabrication and 3D printing um, to make, uh, make a, a construction uh, more uh, efficient and, and sustainable. Um, and that really required uh, rethinking our design methods. Um, so I'm, I'm, let's say, navigating always in between uh, design and technology, um, mm. but mainly uh, fusing both in, a, in, in something that tends to be uh, completely, completely new in the, in the way it understands the tools necessary to, uh, to materialize the objects that, that we design. And um, that's how um, Nagami started. Um, so we were uh, playing for a few years uh, in academic setups um, with uh, uh, large scale 3D printing. Um, so we, we got the, the um, FDM 3D printing model that we normally see in desktop printers and, uh, and developed our own tools uh, to be adapted to um, industrial robots so that we can increase the scale and bring objects uh, bigger and bigger, but also faster and faster. Um, so at some point we got a, a commission uh, from the Centre Pompidou uh, for a piece that would materialize that research uh, into a seating object, a, a chair. And um, so we took that, that project on board and, and uh, used it also as an excuse to create, create a company that would make this process uh, much more robust, uh, that would develop also uh, uh, its own um, uh, plastic extrusion uh, technology and that um, after this project would take on uh, to uh, become a, a design brand and produce uh, objects uh, that uh, were previously unseen with other technologies, uh, but that would also uh, access a, a wider market. Uh, so in 2017, uh, we released the, uh, the voxel chair. Um, that was this uh, piece of research uh, developing in collaboration with my, my research lab at the Bartlett and, and Nagami. Um, I recently founded a startup back, back then. And uh, since then, uh, we've been working on uh, many different uh, uh, objects, sometimes uh, products, sometimes larger objects, and uh, sometimes also uh, developed internally or, or that I designed myself. And, uh, and others in collaboration with um, renowned designers and architects, uh, such as uh, Ross Lovegrove, Saha Hadid architects, et cetera. And uh, that's more or less where we are. The, the, the main idea of, of Nagami, and that's uh, what we're putting all our efforts on, is to uh, advance in a, a design and 3D printing technology so that uh, we can build objects in a much more sustainable way. Um, so we don't produce stock, produce on demand 100% with uh, recycled materials. Uh, we have a, a complete circular economy. So any waste that we produce, we can reinsert um, in, in the production uh, uh, cycle. And uh, by increasing the, the scale and also the, the demand for uh, 3D printed uh, objects, um, we basically increase also the, the speed uh, at uh, um, for for uh, cleaning our our coastlines and and getting rid of our plastic waste. Uh, so the more Nagami grows, um, basically the the faster uh, the uh, plastic waste gets uh, converted into beautiful objects, and that's that's our main concern and our main goal. 
Oh, so you mean the material, the plastic you use are all recyclable or like they're all from the recycled plastic? Yes, they, they are all 100% recycled and recyclable, right? Oh. Um, yeah, so we use mainly uh, two uh, materials, uh, two grades of, mm -hmm. of recycled plastics. Uh, one of those is um, uh, ocean plastic uh, that is developed by our, our partner, uh, partly for the oceans. So they collect um, uh, plastic waste from uh, coastlines and, and then uh, process it and, uh, and send it to us for, um, uh, to, be, to be converted into um, uh, furniture, um, art pieces and, and other kind of objects. So uh, before I dig in deeper, uh, I wanted to like ask you a little bit more about like the 3D printing that you create because normally, uh, what's the difference from like regular 3D printing? Because I went online, I saw a lot like your 3D printing is like with like this really huge arm like you did. And then uh, I don't know, it's probably a little bit different from what I thought that 3D printing is. Can you tell me a little bit more about the difference and uh, what's really unique about like your 3D printing? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, there are different kind of uh, uh, 3D printing methods, right? Um, mm -hmm. So we have SLS, FDM, SLA, etc. And it, each of them is a completely different process. Uh, but what differentiates them uh, mainly is the use of uh, support material or not, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you see a, like a, um, the most commonly mm -hmm. known uh, 3D printer, like a maker bot, an Ultimaker, et cetera, they use a, an FDM process, uh, which means they get, a, they get a filament of plastic, they melt it, mm -hmm. and uh, they extrude a, a, a very a thin um, a tool path, right? And uh, so essentially, you can get any object divided into lines and then mm -hmm. um, contour those, those lines uh, on top of each other. Um, what we are doing is, uh, is actually scaling up that process massively. Mm -hmm. uh, so instead of working with, uh, with filament, we work with the raw plastic um, that is um, obviously much le less processed, uh, meaning uh, uh, cheaper and more sustainable. And uh, instead of uh, printing a very, very thin um, uh, layer, uh, we, pr we print very thick. Right. And, oh. and that's, that's how we can actually print a chair in three, four hours, um, because we um, basically slice this chair uh, into thick layers of plastic. And, and that uh, creates plenty of opportunities, but also constraints uh, to the, the design process. So we always design shapes that can be sustained without the use of a supporting material. So shapes that we can then break into lines and those lines will be supported by uh, the lines that have been uh, materialized before, right? So we build up um, the object in, in layers. Um, and this, the, this process is called uh, FDM uh, printing. There are other processes like SLS um, that are only available uh, for, uh, um, let's say a desktop uh, scale. So you can only produce small objects um, yeah. that are much more free in terms of the shape that you can materialize uh, because they use support materials and it's a completely different concept. Um, we are very aware of the limitations of, uh, of the scale that we work with. And, um, and also uh, we, we try to take those as, as opportunities for designing different, um, mm. designing for, uh, from and for this technology. Um, so that, that's where we are. Um, we developed our own uh, plastic extruder. So that's the, that's the machine that you see attached to the robot. And we program yeah. both the extruder and the, and the robot uh, to um, follow these, um, these layers or these tool paths and pour material accordingly. That's really interesting because you sort of almost have this end to end like from the material, the raw material itself to like how to extract the, uh, the plastic into like making into a chair. That's uh, the, this like whole end-to-end -end design and process is really interesting. So um, you design a lot of chair or seat and at the, at the same time, you actually collaborate with a lot of artists or designers. So what's a regular process with it? Because like 
I, I'm not so sure because I don't know. Like, uh, uh, some of the artists probably are not like familiar with like uh, 3D printing or robotic 3D printing because I know that like, I saw like a lot of chair interior why they have like uh, the structure to support the whole chair. Like, so what's the process like of like the whole thing? Yeah, um, so to, to design with this technology, you need mm -hmm. to understand the technology and you need yeah. to understand these limitations and opportunities that I was, I was describing before. Um, so we, we do actually receive uh, plenty of requests of um, um, forms and shapes um, that are just not natural to 3D printing. And then those would require extra structures, uh, will require uh, molds, will require post-processing. It's just um, a very forced marriage in between design and technology. And that, that normally happens when a designer is just conceiving a form uh, or conceiving a, a functional object, but without really taking into account the way, the way that's made. And then they, they look for it um, after the design is almost completed. We work in the complete, uh, complete uh, opposite way. Uh, so when, when we work with a designer, uh, first we try to uh, choose uh, the designers that actually understand this technology and that mm -hmm. are forward looking in uh, the way they think about uh, objects, but also um, uh, the way they, they, they see how this technology could bring um, objects to life that were impossible to materialize uh, with traditional manufacturing. And we work with them from the very beginning of the process. So uh, they have an idea. Well, first they, they understand the, the, the technology, then they have an idea. We look at it and see if that works within these limitations. Like for example, if it, um, if it fits in the bonding box in the, of the robot or it needs to be made, uh, made out of pieces. If um, the, the cantilevers are controlled enough so the material will not fall uh, to the ground or will not be floating in the air. Um, so things that are very natural to uh, our process that, that we obviously have an expertise on, um, we introduce them in, in the conversation with a with designer. And if it's, a, if it's a, an intelligent uh, and, and brilliant designer, like the ones we work with, uh, then that, um, that communication is actually very smooth and um, produces an, an object of uh, uh, very uh, unique qualities. Uh, but it is important to um, choose very wisely um, who you work with, with a, a technology that is um, that uh, defined as ours. Um, mm -hmm. We <laughs> normally, when, when we get external requests um, that are unfeasible, uh, we normally start with the same sentences. Uh, actually, 3D printing is, is not the ultimate tool to build absolutely anything. No, it, it, mm. it is an industrial process. It, it has its uh, limitations, uh, probably many, yeah. like, ma much uh, less than uh, other processes that we've worked with before. Like we can create um, structures that, um, that have an inside uh, layer that would be impossible to demold in an injection molding process or things like that. We built in, in, in thin air, right? Like um, mm -hmm. we don't need any base for, for printing. But to take advantage of all, all those properties, uh, you really need to understand and acknowledge the, the constraints as well. Mm. So um, about the limitation, is there any, any like limitation you want to break? Or is there anything that you want to like create to like, wow, like you break this limit? Well, uh, we're, we're pushing the limits of, uh, of uh, uh, 3D printing at this scale almost every day. Um, I, I, I'm not sure what is the division in, in the company in between um, design, product development, and R&D, and, and um, fabrication or production. Uh, almost every project we do has a research and, a research and, and, and development component, and each of them is introducing something new mm. um, to, to the field of 3D printing. Uh, like we're now, for example, printing with two robots simultaneously, uh, mm. controlling um, uh, color gradients in the mix. That is uh, something that became 
um, almost a, a, a signature of, of, of the company. Uh, how to control that better, um, how to print them more efficient and faster, how to minimize uh, this uh, overhand so that you have um, a, um, a greater formal, uh, formal freedom. Um, currently, also, most of our efforts are directed towards uh, printing larger objects. Um, so we're printing uh, sculptures of uh, three and a half meter tall in 48 hours, uh, we're printing entire entire pavilions uh, that are waterproofed, that uh, integrate uh, furniture and integrate many of the construction layers that in traditional um, architecture uh, would, would be completely detached from each other. Uh, so we're really trying to rethink um, design and construction processes at, at every level. And, Every project is, is, a, is a total challenge uh, since it, it really requires a completely different way of thinking. That's really interesting. Uh, I want to bring back to fashion a little bit. So you recently just collaborated with the designer, like fashion designer. And then obviously there's like um, a lot of designers who are also like challenges 3D printing, like Iris Herben and Balenciaga just did like a 3D printing shoes. Uh, I think that's really cool. So uh, what's your ideas or uh, concept or, or like your general thought about like 3D printing in fashion? Yeah, so um, well, the, the experience with the, with Ivan Andreu was, uh, was, was great actually, because it was uh, probably the, I think the first time that a uh, robotics 3D printing is, is used uh, for, for fashion objects. Um, so tradi traditionally, and that's a that's a strange word to use, uh, tradition in a in a three D printing context. But um, most of the three uh, D printed uh, clothing that we've seen are uh, coming from uh, smaller size printers, from um, more uh, SLS processes, and so on that give you this complete uh, uh, form of freedom. Um, but uh, and they they are fantastic. Like the you know some of the pieces that Louis van Herpen uh, is doing are just are just incredible. Um, but I think um, for for us, what we what we wanted to tap into um, was to actually use uh, processes that are uh, faster, cheaper, more efficient uh, in in a fashion context, um, and that's a huge difference with uh, like. Taking SLS printing, for example, um, and uh, materializing an entire dress, which is is uh, mainly uh, focused towards uh, all couture, mm -hmm. um, because the, produ the production cost is is very high still, and that will go yeah. lower and lower and lower. And of course, in the future, we will all have uh, three three D printed clothing. Um, but uh, right now, at the current stage of of technology, um, if you really think um with uh, those processes that um, that are uh, already efficient you know? like robotics 3d printing like pouring a line for a dress it really takes 10 minutes right so yeah. we are actually like many of the of the pieces that we were producing with with Ivan uh, were almost kind of like discussed with him and on the go printing and then uh, look at the piece together and I made three touches and and uh, uh, we rethink the design. Um, so somehow, actually, our our process that is not thought for fashion at all, mm -hmm. um, but actually for much larger pieces, uh, when applied to fashion, it has a very very interesting twist uh, because of its efficiency and, and agility. Um, mm -hmm. Like this uh, butterfly, for example, that we uh, printed with him, that that took only like half an hour or so. Um, oh. Yeah, and then we, you can you can mold it. You can you can really play with the body as well. So it's a it's a very experimental process still, um, but it actually has a lot of possibilities. I think in the in the fashion in the fashion world. Mm, that's really interesting. So uh, do you think like, I mean, I'm a, I don't know because I I don't know much about it. Do you think that three D printing can like print like soft material in the future, or like do you think that's kind of be like workable in the future? Yeah, that's that's a good point, and also tapping into the previous conversation. Um, 
Uh, it is possible to 3D print with, with soft materials. And many of these examples that I was mentioning before are actually uh, made out of soft materials. Um, those are uh, much more difficult to control. Um, mm -hmm. So in, again, in the, in the small scale, um, that is um, something uh, quite, quite doable. Um, in the larger scale, we've actually tried to print with soft materials and, and we're uh, developing research uh, projects uh, using those, uh, but it is much tougher um, since uh, the material is much less stable. Right. Um, so when you're when you're printing with a with a material that is soft, but you you have the volume constraint in yeah. kind of this size, and and you are solidifying like each each particle of material, then that's is easy uh, to to control the shape in a natural manner. Um, when you are dealing with a, a, a much uh, larger volume uh, without this constraint, I mean, you are pouring very thick. Um, a material that then has its own life, uh, then that's that's very difficult to to control. But we're we're getting there. Um, there are also some um, very successful ex uh, experiments, like uh, MIT printing uh, soft material in, in in gel with with scalatids, and um, other more academic environments as well, developing research in, in this area. Um, and I'm I'm pretty sure. Uh, material limitations uh, will just shrink uh, massively in the in the coming years. That's really interesting. So uh, before I head up to the, uh, the last question, I want to ask you about your vision. Can you tell me a little bit about your vision for like your company or 3D printing in general? Yeah. Um, well, so so Nagami's uh, vision um, is is mainly to. Uh, open uh, a new universe of possibilities uh, of objects that can be efficiently uh, designed and produced with waste material. Um, so we, we really try to um, kind of um, open the spectrum um, of uh, furniture and architectures and other kind of products that were impossible to materialize uh, with other manufacturing methods. And that 3D printing uh, fairs um, allow these shapes to emerge almost magically. Like the, the, the objects that we produce uh, caused this the, uh, impact of the unbelievable uh, because they were, they were just impossible to, to create before this technology. Um, but also and more importantly, um, introduce a much more uh, sustainable uh, way of, uh, of uh, producing both products and architecture. Uh, 3D printing establishes a, um, incredibly, an incredibly short production chain. So rather than having multiple machines okay. uh, to produce one civilized product, we have one machine that can produce an infinite number of variations. And that is an incredible opportunity. So we don't need to set up, we don't need like a huge investment, uh, initial investment for every product we create. We are much more versatile to shift uh, from one product to another and respond to fluctuating demands, uh, which is something that the, the design industry just uh, couldn't do um, that uh, efficiently uh, before. And uh, while we increase uh, the demand and the possibilities of um, um, uh, 3D printing at, at this scale, uh, where then again opening up uh, to many more ideas about how to use the plastic waste that we've uh, we've been producing for for decades. Um, we always say that we we work with a with an unfortunately unlimited resource, and but it's true is uh, we have plastic in planet Earth. Um, and we will have it forever. So we better make a, a good use of it. Uh, and we keep on being uh, creative, uh, creative about it, not only to develop technologies to uh, recycle and deal with those wastes uh, much more efficiently, uh, but also to design a much more beautiful and creative world. Um, so that's where we want to contribute. That's really interesting. And then like it's reusable, right? The all the materials. So like if you don't want it, you can just like do 
like in our things with the same material that you you build. Yes, absolutely. You can you can spread it. If you don't like one of our chairs, <laughs> uh, I mean can, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> that's not gonna happen, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> but if you, if it's still you don't, uh, you can uh, spread it and then get it back into the cycle and uh, create a new one. Um, oh. So that is uh, an incredibly interesting opportunity. That's really interesting. So the last question, because it's the topic of this whole like issue, is something new. Can you tell me something new? Anything? It's fine. Can I tell you something something new. Yeah, something well, new. Anything. <laughs> I just want to say that um, things things that we uh, were new before uh, now should be real. You know, and um, there is a complete di uh, difference between something new and something that makes an impact, yeah? Mm -hmm. There are plenty of discoveries in, in tech and in the design world every day, um, but only a few of those managed to go then through the struggle uh, to uh, create a, a, a product or a system of production uh, that really makes an impact in industry. Um, so rather than something, something new just for it to be new uh you need to create something new and relevant that will make a difference um so i hope we're trying to make a difference and um and uh, i i really um, look up uh, look up to um some of those companies that are trying to rethink the process of of designing and making um in vehicles, in architecture, in aerospace. Um, so again, not just create something new, but, but push for it uh, so that it becomes real. Well, that's really nice. Thank you very much, uh, Manuel, for this whole like, conversation. I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much. <laughs>